The peace of Christ be with you. Hey, let's give an amen to our new friends. Amen. Let's do it. Thank you very much. We also have a number of people visiting and discerning whether this soil is where they want to root their life. And we want to welcome you here today to Oak Child. Yes. We love hope. And we hope that you have a wonderful day of visiting here. This morning, I want to teach us a word. And I want to connect that word to what we're doing here in chapel, which is prayer, which is worship. And the word is glory. Do you know this word? Glory. Say it with me. Glory. I, I, when I point at you, I want you to say it with, with conviction. Glory. Up in the balcony. Glory. South side. Glory. North side. Glory. Balcony. Glory. South side. Glory. North side. Glory. Glory. All together. Glory. 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 It's one of those great words in the Bible. Glory. To experience glory is to experience the center of reality. To experience glory is to be in the very presence of a living God, the full majesty and the wonder. It is to be in the presence of the holy of holies. Glory fills the temple. What I hope happens for us is that we get a picture, a experience of glory. And I hope that that picture and that experience is connected to our life of prayer. I think that there's a direct correspondence between prayer and glory. glory. Paul, uh, Josh mentioned, for those of you who are visiting, that we are in the Psalms, the book of prayer, the school of prayer, where Christians have for centuries learned and assimilated a vocabulary to talk to God. In the preface to the Psalms, Calvin describes it as the anatomy of the human soul. It's the place where we come to articulate the full scope and geography of the human condition. But one of the things we haven't talked about when we talk about prayer, and what we should have maybe at the very beginning, is to offer a warning. Kind of like one of those warnings on the pack of cigarettes. This is, beware, this is dangerous. Because prayer is dangerous. Prayer is not safe. It's dangerous and it's not safe because of the person we are praying to. Because of what that God does. And what that God does shapes how we should pray. This morning I want to listen to a psalm, Psalm 29, that helps us to see who God is and what God does and how that might shape a habit in a life of prayer, as well as kind of give a warning of what could happen in prayer. So if you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 29. And hear the word of the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and Do his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth like flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And all in his temple, and all in his temple say, glory. glory. All in his temple say, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned forever. May the Lord give his people strength. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah. 
to pray is not safe. To go to chapel, to go to worship is not, not something we should do lightly. I love this thought by Annie Dillard. Do you know this quote? She writes that it is madness to wear ladies and velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue us life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews for the sleeping God may awake and take offense or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. The waking God may draw us out to where we never return. Psalm 29 reminds us that we worship in a context. We move and live and have our being all in a world where there is a living God who is awake and wants to draw us out to where we can never return. Psalm 29 reminds us something fundamental about God that I believe shapes something fundamental about prayer. And what we learn fundamentally about God and about what God does is that God is loquacious. God is a speaking God. God has a voice, and that voice is powerful and full of majesty. That voice has power to break the cedars, to make the mountain skip like an ox. God has a voice, and when God speaks, something happens. The very first thing that we know about who God is and what God does is that God speaks. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered over the face of the deep, God's spirit hovers over all things. And then God says, let there be light. And there was light. God speaks. It's the first activity of God. And any time God speaks, something new happens. God's voice is the primal energy of creation. Everything that we see, everything that we study here at Hope College has some correspondence to God's voice. I think that should fill us with both hope and promise as well as peril. Hope and promise because it means that at any time this free and sovereign God has the capacity to speak into our life something new and to reshape a conversation, a circumstance, and a moment. The people of God are always a people of hope. Because God speaks in any time, at any place, for anyone, when God's voice is heard and obeyed, something new is created. The old is gone and the new is before us. It should fill us with the promise of hope, but at the same time, it should fill us with peril. Because when God's voice speaks, it thunders, it breaks the cedars, it disrupts, it disorders, it shakes up our presumed assumptions about what our life should be about. If there is a God who sits enthroned forever, when that God speaks, we have to listen to it with care and ignore it at our peril. For God's voice is the voice of the living God. And I think fundamentally that should teach us something about prayer and how to pray. Oftentimes I think that we think of prayer as merely just our personal monologue to God, that we're doing all the talking. But if Psalm 21, 29 is right, and I think that it is, it means that prayer might be more of a conversation. Prayer might be more of a place where we listen to a speaking God. Psalm 29 reminds us that God speaks, and then it reminds us of our responsibility to hear Prayer is not so much just us talking to God as it is about us listening to God. Which means that in our life together, in our worship life, corporately, in our private life, we need to create space to listen to God. And if we listen to God, maybe, just maybe, God could do something new in your life, in the life of this community, in the life of this world. God is speaking. God speaks most 
clearly and with the greatest clarity and consequence through Holy Scripture, and when we open up the book that we love and we listen to it, we are once again confronted and confounded by the living voice of God. And that living voice of God has been communicated to us in the revelation of Jesus. Jesus is the one that overwhelms the world. Jesus' voice is the one that breaks the cedars. Jesus is the one who unlocks the door and pushes us out pushes us out of the citadel of the self so that we might run free and wild in the wide open country of salvation. Jesus is God's living voice that echoes down the canyons of time. And if we have the courage and the faith to hear it, he will bless us with strength and with peace. But here's the question, the fundamental question for all of us. Do we want to listen to that voice? Because if we do, it will change us. Do we really, really, really want to hear God's voice? Do we want God to speak into how we think about our future? What you should do with your particular endowed gifts of reason and imagination? your skills? Do you, we want God to speak about how to imagine using our money or how we should think about sex or our relationships? Do we want God's voice to shape us? It is dangerous to say yes to that because God may draw us out to a place we can never return, but it is also the act of hope Because where God wants to draw us out to is that place where we are free, where we are healed, where we are healed, where everyone in the temple says glory. If we say yes to that, God will bring us into that landscape, that geography, where we are saturated in the reality of a living God whose presence caused all things in heaven and on earth to bow down and to worship and to say glory. My friends, go into this weekend with the posture to listen. And if you hear the voice, maybe just maybe whisper under your breath, glory. Take that word with you. Put it in your pocket and let it speak. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace.